All right, thank you. Um, lovely seeing so many of you here, despite of this uh, horrible Amsterdam December weather. Very glad that you made it. Um, I'm very proud to uh, have Charles Heller here. And before I introduce him, uh, I just want to let uh, say a word about the format of it. So I will give a five minutes uh, introduction to basically the topic a bit and to uh, present Charles Heller. And then um, Charles will give a 40, 45 minutes uh, presentation about some of the recent work that Board of Forensics has been doing. And then will basically the idea is to open it up to discussion because I guess there will be tons of questions afterwards. So um, Charles will basically be speaking about uh, forms of contesting border violence at uh, Europe's external, well, at Europe's borders. Well, since the 1990s, um, migration scholars um, in the, have observed in the global north that border controls have become outsourced and relocated. Europe's borders stretch outwards to the coast of Senegal and to the airports of Lagos. And immigration controls are also performed by private actors such as airline companies and personnel of ferry companies. So what has traditionally been really a core task of uh, members of a state sovereign um, sovereignty has now become privatized as well over the past three decades or so. Um, this relocation and outsourcing of border controls has not gone uncontested. Human rights lawyers successfully contested remote practices of migration control um, before human rights courts. In 2012, the European Court of Human Rights, this is just an example, declared the Italian policy of intercepting migrants in the Mediterranean Sea and turning them over to the Libyan authorities as a violation of the European Convention on Human Rights. Yet, these kind of stories turned out to be Pyrrhic victories. Governments, which were keen to continue restrictive bordering policies, used human rights judgments as blueprints, as scholars have pointed out, as blueprints to avoid the cost of future human rights violations. So instead of European Coast Guards intercepting migrant vessels on the high sea, it was now Libyan and other states, third countries, uh, Coast Guards that intercepted these migrant vessels uh, powered by the financial and operative support of European states. This shift um, was also enabled and reinforced through concrete material changes of the border architecture. So you could think about these material changes in a way that while well, 30 years ago, um, the architecture of European borders resembled more of a fenced cage, it is today more akin to a US supermax prison with infrared cameras, movement sensors and algorithms that predict the prison's uh, population's behavior. Um, the operation of European borders relies on the collection of real-time data uh, on migratory movements through technologies of surveillance, satellites, drones, and other fancy gadgets, in order to enable real-time responses. Data on mi migratory movement is stored in large-scale EU-wide databases, which are rendered um, interoperable and searchable through algorithms. And these databases ought to predict migratory movement, detect, uh, detect threats, and they also steer policy decisions. These changes also result in a transformation of the violence um, at European borders inflicted upon the bodies of migrants. Violence, um, in this sense, became perhaps more insidious and concealed. Um, I recently returned from, um, <clears throat> from a conference in Lesbos, in Lesbos where men in plain clothes, uh, presumably Greek law enforcement personnel, abducted migrants from the island and abandoned them on non-maneuverable uh, inflatable life rafts in the Aegean Sea. 
At the same time, makeshift facilities are turned into secret incommunicado detention centers for people who were apprehended crossing the borders. At the same time, we've also observed over the past couple of years the scaling back of search and rescue activities by European countries in the Mediterranean Sea, which resulted, as Itamar Mann, a migration scholar, showed, in legal black holes where an individual's right to get rescued on the high sea is left without a corresponding duty of a state to rescue. I should add, of some individuals only, um, that is, destitute and racialized individuals. Um, these dehumanizing border policies um, at Europe's borders call for critical and radical practices that render these forms of violence visible, both materially but also discursively. One of these individuals is Charles Heller. Um, he's profoundly engaged in critical practices of making border violence visible. Charles is director at Border Forensic, an institution, or I should rather say the institution at a global level, that employs innovative methods of, uh, from architecture and forensic to investigate into practices of, of border violence. Their work, uh, border violence's work, has been used in national, in domestic, and international court as evidence to hold states accountable. In addition to his work at Border Forensics, Charles um, is also an avid filmmaker, um, artist, and an academic. So, um, whereas I barely manage to uh, live up to one role of an academic, I really don't know how Charles manages to fit three roles into one life. Uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Charles, and I, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Stefan, for this generous um, introduction. And, um, well, you know, to that question, I guess we need to challenge borders also within our own disciplines and practices. Um, and I have asked myself at times, Charles, you know, why don't you get a proper job, fit in, into one of those boxes? Um, but I've come to accept that that's the way I think and operate in the world, that, that intersection um, between uh, research, human rights activism, and aesthetic practice. I'm, um, I want to start this talk with a note that is entirely uh, unplanned, um, but very important for me. Um, only a few minutes ago, I was standing outside, uh, meeting for the first time um, one of the survivors of the, in, one of the incidents that we investigated more than 10 years ago. I'd never met him. We'd been in touch for years, but we had never met before. And in, on this rainy uh, night in Amsterdam, um, this person who has now rebuilt his life as a family, uh, lives somewhere in Holland, um, met just briefly. Uh, we met just briefly. And so I want to you know, just start with a, a thought um, and somehow a dedication to the courage of all border crossers, to the courage that they muster in seeking to cross the borders that they are denied the right to cross, the courage that they must muster to rebuild their lives after uh, events of border violence, but also somehow maybe to um, thinking about human bonds across boundaries, across space, across time, that connect us, even at times when we have never met. So, with that thought, um, dedicated to this person I've just barely met, and I'm, as you see, deeply moved by this, um, this encounter, I want to now go um, into the the thoughts and the material that I've uh, planned to share with you uh, today. So what I want to try and do, um, as Stefan mentioned, is through um, a series of investigations that we've led 
over the years, first within the Forensic Oceanography Project, which I co-directed with Lorenzo Pizzani between 2011 and 2021, and then with a series of investigations as well led within the Border uh, Forensics Project, which has gone beyond the borders of uh, the Mediterranean and maritime spaces, right, to document different spatialities and modalities of border violence. What I want to do by tracing um, some of these investigations is look at the changing modalities of border violence at Europe's borders and think of the distinct challenges that each of these forms of violence raise, both in terms of documenting them but also, as we'll see, and as Stefan has already um, hinted at, in terms of seeking accountability for them and contesting them, blocking them through um, legal practice. Now, before um, I go deeper into those very specific incidents, I want to say a few words about border violence more generally, right? And I think we need to acknowledge that border violence is not some, some isolated incident. Border violence is a structural outcome of the European border regime. And it's a structural outcome of what I and we refer to as mobility conflicts, right? The clash between the reality of the dynamics of migration between the global south and the global north and restrictive policies imposed by um, the most powerful states in the world, again, across the global north. But you see, of course, um, that may include South Africa. It may include different states across um, the Arabian um, Peninsula. So we have this clash, right, between the dynamics of migration and restrictive policies targeting the movement of people of the global south. And what has emerged over the years um, is a highly uneven global mobility regime, right, which allocates differential rights to move and stay on the basis of a kind of matrix of categories, of citizenship, of class, of race, and other um, categories. And in effect, I think we need to understand the way borders operate today as a kind of political technology that is mobilized by powerful states to police populations on a global scale on the basis of these categories, right? Now, as a result of these restrictive mi migration policies, which again are at odds in contradiction with the dynamics, the really existing dynamics of migration, well, those who refuse their assignation in this hierarchy of mobility, those who refuse to be assigned in space and denied the right to move, must do so um, through unauthorized means, through precarious means, and are often exposed to um, violence. So I think it's really important, before we go into more specific incidents and the way we sought to contest them, to acknowledge a simple thing. Border violence is structural, right? It's a structural outcome of these mobility conflicts and the European migration regime in particular, right? And it is an outcome of these systemic conditions of racism, of global inequality, right? And we need to acknowledge that border violence will be produced and reproduced as long as these, as these systemic conditions are left unchanged. Now, I'm sorry to have to break it to you, and that's not very rejoicing, right? Um, but you see, I'm, I'm not quite uh, depressed. Um, I do believe, in fact, despite acknowledging that border violence is structural and that it is here to stay, that there are many different practices that we can engage with to contest border violence, and that these are important, even though, as we will see, border violence changes, reconfigures 
And that simply means that we need to adapt and uh, shift our tactics of contestation um, as well. Our work um, of developing new methods to document border violence and contest its changing forms began in the Mediterranean and the central Mediterranean, which, as you can see from this map uh, based on the International Organization for Migration data, is the epicenter of a global landscape of death. But if you look at the data that has been collected by United since the early 90s, specifically focusing on um, border deaths at, Euro at Europe's disseminated borders, and um, one of the founders of this network is present in the room this evening, and I would encourage you to look at this uh, book which is uh, the publication of this entire list of 52,760 documented deaths over the last um, 30 years. Maybe I can circulate this. If you look carefully at this list, you will very quickly realize that the main cause of death is drowning. Just look at the first cases on this list. Drowned, 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 drowned. What we are discussing here when we talk about several, several tens of thousands of people who have died primarily at sea is not only precisely deaths at sea, but deaths through the sea. Deaths that are inflicted through what we refer to as liquid violence, right? It is the liquid element, the liquid environment that has been turned into a lethal element for um, migrants seeking to cross that space as a result of restrictive migration policies and bordering uh, practices. Now, this form of indirect violence um, points already to, I would say, the main challenge that we faced in our early investigations, starting 2011, on border violence at and through the sea, i.e., these are primarily forms of indirect violence mediated by the liquid environment but also, as we'll see, mediated by many different actors, right, that are somehow located between the bodies and lives of illegalized migrants from the global south and EU state policies and actors, right. So how do we document and trace these forms of indirect violence, and how do we seek accountability for them? Right. These are some of the challenges that we faced in our first investigations focusing on the maritime borders of Europe. We began our work back in 2011 with um, the Arab uprisings, which were at the same time as they were leading to the toppling or destabilizing of North African regimes such as the Ben Ali regime in uh, Tunisia they were also leading to the destabilization of the European border regime, which had relied on these authoritarian governments to impose uh, border closure beyond its territory. As of um, January to April 2011, several dozens of thousands of Tunisians seized their freedom to move. They took to the sea after taking to the streets, as several told us. But as the uprising in Libya was repressed by the Gaddafi regime and quickly um, degenerated into um, a civil war, which was further heightened by the NATO-led uh, military intervention against the Gaddafi regime, people started fleeing Libya as well. 
And by May 2011, there were more than 1,500 deaths that had been registered amongst those fleeing Libya only. Now, these deaths were occurring at a time when, as you see from this slide, as a result of the NATO-led military intervention um, deployed against the Gaddafi regime, the central Mediterranean was simply put the most surveyed maritime space on Earth. There were 38 warships, but also AWACS and other surveillance means deployed in that space that these migrants were crossing. And there were increasing indications from um, survivor testimonies that um, these military actors were failing in their obligation to rescue any person found in distress at sea, regardless of his or her nationality, right? As all states uh, bound by um, national law, but also international law, are uh, obliged. And so a small French migrants' rights NGO, the GISTI, the Groupe d'Information et de Soutien aux Immigrés, published this press statement, as you see on the 9th of June 2011. And in it, they announced that they would be filing a complaint against NATO, the EU, and all states taking part in uh, the coalition of, against Libya. They formulated a very simple argument. Because of the degree of surveillance deployed in that space and time, military actors could not not know of migrants' distress. And by failing to assist these people in distress, they were guilty of the crime of non-assistance. Now, the truth is that the Gisti didn't really know how they would file that case. But somehow, um, that press statement created its own reality. Two young PhD students, myself and Lorenzo Pezzani, reached out to them thinking maybe with the emerging methods that were being developed within forensic architecture, maybe we could help. The truth is we had no idea either, but we had a hypothesis. And the hypothesis I think is founded on two um, main methodological moves. On the one hand, we might mobilize against the grain the different surveillance means deployed by states to monitor and govern the sea. And we might use some of those same technologies against the grain, not to shed light on unauthorized border crossings, but to shed light on border violence instead. Second, we believed that we would be able to spatialize those traces and reinscribe those practices, those, those particular events across the different jurisdictions of, um, that make up the unbundled sovereignty, um, to use Saskia Sassen's term, that uh, constitutes the political geography of the sea, right? The maritime space is not a lawless space outside um, of state sovereignty. It's rather a space of shared and overlapping sovereignty, right? And we needed to inscribe those particular events and practices within those jurisdictions to try and reinscribe responsibility in what had become a sea of impunity. We began focusing on what is known today as the Left to Die Boat case, a boat that left the shores of Libya on the 27th of March, 2011, with 72 passengers on board, including Dan Haile Gebre, whom you see here drawing uh, during uh, the interview that we conducted with him. And despite it, despite repeated interactions with state actors, such as this French military aircraft, which took a photograph of the passengers in the early afternoon of the 27th of March and sent it to the Italian Coast Guard, despite a distress signal, several distress signals that were sent out 
to all vessels transiting in the area, thus containing the exact position of the boat in distress and indicating the condition of the passengers, the 72 passengers were abandoned to drift for 14 days in NATO's maritime surveillance area. Upon their landing in Libya, only nine people had survived. So how could we reconstruct this form of killing without touching? In addition to interviewing um, the survivors once again, we collected different elements such as this photograph, the stress signal that contained geo-referenced uh, data. We then called upon an oceanographer to model the boat's drift during its 14 days on the base of wind and current data, somehow bringing the sea to testify for how it had been made to kill. We knew then the vessel's trajectory during those 14 days. The question began, where were those 38 warships that you saw deployed only days before the boat left the Libyan coast? To try and answer that question, we used synthetic aperture radar imagery, a form of satellite image which is produced by beaming a radar signal onto the surface of the Earth. This image has a resolution of 75 meters, meaning that migrants unauthorized uh, crossings are beneath the threshold of detectability, while the large vessels of warships or merchant ships present at the time would appear as one or two pixels. The image then does not allow us to determine the exact identity of the ships in vicinity to the drifting boat, which you see indicated in yellow right here. But it does allow us to say that at the time the boat was drifting, it was surrounded by several ships, several of which must have been military, and the closest which could have assisted the passengers in less than two hours. On the basis of these different methods, we produced, um, we reconstructed the trajectory of the boat and its different moments of interaction in uh, an extensive report, um, which was produced as well in close collaboration with other actors, uh, including journalist Emiliano Bus, but I'm also thinking, since I am in uh, Holland today, uh, with the politician Tineke Strick. And this was a basis for several legal complaints against states taking part in the operation against France, against Italy, against Spain, um, against Belgium as well. Most of the cases have been closed, but in fact, the case in France, more than 10 years after the events, has been reopened um, recently. And as the Gisti uh, um, uh, communicated in, his, in a statement uh, last year, more than 10 years after the Left to Die Boat case, will the in investigation finally begin? So here you see with the Left to Die Boat case, our first investigation, and I, and I guess you, I hope you start to understand the particular problems that we were uh, confronted with. How do you develop means to document a form of violence that kills without touching, that operates as much through action than inaction, right? Nobody shot at the 63 passengers of the Left to Die Boat case. They were killed by the refusal of all actors around them to assist them and avert their tragic fate. Now, that question of distance and how to re reconstruct violence at a distance continued to be at the center of our work over um, subsequent investigations. In particular, in April 2015, on the 12th of April and the 18th of April, respectively, the two largest documented shipwrecks in recent Mediterranean history occurred. In both those shipwrecks, both those shipwrecks occurred not as a result of 
vessels in vicinity failing in assisting them. Rather, they occurred at the very moment of attempted rescue by merchant ships. Right. This is, in fact, a photograph taken of the shipwreck of the 12th um, of April 2015, in which more than 400 people died. And it is taken from the deck of a merchant ship that was approaching to rescue the passengers. But just as the minute, at, at the moment it was approaching, the passengers moved from one side to the other of the boat. The boat capsized. And when, within minutes, the passengers um, had sank. So there was no violation to speak of in the immediate space-time of the shipwreck. And in fact, Matteo Renzi, uh, Italian prime minister at the time, was very quick to blame as responsible for these shipwrecks the, the traffickers, the slave traders of the 21st century, as he referred to them. But our analysis um, of changing policies and practices at the border rather indicated another dimension of responsibility which lay beyond the immediate space-time of the shipwreck. In fact, our argument in the Death by Rescue um, report is that these deaths were not the outcome so much of immediate practices of non-assistance within that space-time of the shipwreck, that bounded space-time, right? But rather of a veritable policy of non-assistance implemented by the EU, which aimed precisely that no European vessel would be in vicinity to those boats in distress and would ever be called upon to operate rescue. This is, in effect, the policy of non-assistance that was implemented by the EU when it decided to um, not support the continuation and Europeanization of the Mare Nostrum operation that Italy had initiated in 2013 in the wake of the Lampedusa shipwreck um, of the, the 3rd of October. As you can see, these are the people who were uh, found in distress and rescued during the Mare Nostrum operation, of which the operational area was very close to the, to the Libyan coast, right? These were some nine warships at its peak, proactively patrolling and rescuing migrants in distress. But very quickly, Mare Nostrum was accused of constituting a pull factor. For anybody who is following uh, debates surrounding um, non-governmental rescue at sea, that argument should sound quite familiar. In effect, that argument has become a veritable ideology and recycled time and again. So when Italy requested that um, the EU Europeanize Mare Nostrum, member states denied as François Crempeau, the UN rapporteur at the time, translated their argument, it's like saying, let them, let them drown, because this is good uh, deterrent. So in effect, instead of Europeanizing Mare Nostrum, the European Commission and member states decided to implement a much more limited in space operation under Frontex, the Triton operation. Here you see the two operational zones compared. But beyond those operational zones, it was also the operational logic and means of that operation that was completely different. Border control, defensive border control, rather than proactive rescue, was its operational uh, logic. Now, during the summer of 2014, during which this um, operational shift was debated in the Commission, in the European Parliament, there were... Um, calls and um, um, from, from different sides denouncing this shift and the risk that it would entail for migrants. Amnesty 
people will attempt the crossing with or without operational Mare Nostrum in place. But without it, many, many more will die. Those calls came, in fact, um, or that assessment, rather, came, in fact, from within Frontex's operational reports as well. The withdrawal of naval assets from the area, if not properly planned and announced well in advance, would likely result in a higher number of fatalities. 26, 28th of August, 2014, internal uh, report um, by uh, Frontex for its Triton operation. In effect, what happened is exactly what these human rights actors and Frontex itself had predicted. There were not fewer crossings, but rather migrants crossing the sea at that time faced rather than a fleet of warships proactively patrolling the coast, they faced a lethal rescue gap. You can see once again um, the rescued people at that time in the, the period the first months of 2015, and you see that they are all without the Triton operation. And since um, there were no longer any European ships patrolling this area, well, the Italian Coast Guard called upon uh, the actors it could, including merchant ships, we be which became the first search and rescue actor in the central Mediterranean in the first months of 2015. This is the King Jacob, 170, 147 meters long. Just imagine this vessel in the night, the middle of the night of the 18th of April, maneuvering to try and rescue a boat overcrowded with more than 900 passengers. The driver mismaneuvered rammed into the tanker, and the boat sank within minutes, swallowing more than 950 lives in a single incident. As you can see, in fact, in the wake of the Mare Nostrum uh, operation following its termination, the mortality rate dramatically increased before being lowered again by the intervention of different actors, including um, civilian search and rescue ships. In fact, in the wake of those shipwrecks, no less than Jean-Claude Juncker partly admitted European guilt for this staggering loss of life. It was a serious mistake to bring the Mare Nostrum operation to an end. It cost human lives. Now, we would contest the term mistake used here to describe a planned policy shift implemented in full knowledge of its lethal impact. Nonetheless, this is a quite um, impressive admission of guilt by no less than the president of the European Commission at the time. A public policy implemented by the EU had cost human lives. Now, what do you expect if a public policy in, say, a hospital or whichever else institution costs human lives? You expect an investi investigation. You expect the director to be fired. You expect someone to go to jail. Now, the next sentence in Jean-Claude Juncker's statements is, in fact, announcing the trebling of Frontex's budget. Frontex, the very agency that had lobbied over the summer of 2014 to end Mare Nostrum and replace it by um, Triton. So here you see another form of border violence operating even at a greater spatial and temporal distance than practices of non-assistance. And as you see, they raise different um, problems, also methodological. It would not have been enough to simply reconstruct um, 
events in the space-time of the shipwreck, even though we did do that. What we needed was to engage in a form of policy forensics that reconstructed the policy-making process, as I've briefly summarized it for you, and um, look not only at a single case, but at patterns of practices and the impact on um, the danger of crossing the sea that this policy shift had, not for one incident, but over many incidents at the time. But here, here too, we found challenges, not only in documenting this form of indirect violence, but also in seeking accountability for it. As brilliant as our legal friends and experts we, we work with uh, are, they were not able to immediately translate this form of lethal policy of abandonment, even though it has been included, for example, in uh, communications to um, the International um, Criminal Court. In the years that followed, we faced other um, forms of distance and mediation in the infliction of border violence. Here very much um, resonating with what Stefan described uh, in his introduction. The involvement of the Libyan uh, Coast Guard in particular. Now, I, I'll go very briefly because Stefan, you summarized it uh, perfectly and, and uh, very succinctly uh, earlier on. But I think that to understand the involvement of the Libyan Coast Guard today, in effect, we need to understand this practice from 2009. You see here a young black man being forcefully taken um, off the deck of an Italian um, uh, border police uh, ship and disembarked in the port of Tripoli, right? And as you mentioned, uh, Stefan, um, Italy was sanctioned for this practice, right? The European Court of Human Rights considered in its hearsay judgment in 2012 that because the passengers had come on board this Italian ship, Italy exercised jurisdiction um, and effective control and had violated its obligation of non refoulement rights. And again, just as you summarized very uh, effectively and succinctly, uh, while this was hailed as a landmark judgment at the time, also with repercussions far beyond the field of migration and borders, there were also more critical voices, such as Sonia Buckles, such as Itamar Mann, which already early on feared that this judgment might be effectively used as a blueprint to define the next modality of border violence. And in effect, after um, an interruption of several years, right, from 2011 to 2016, 17, there are no pushbacks um, across the central Mediterranean. And by the way, we should acknowledge that. That's a success. Even though we will acknowledge as well that uh, border violence adapts. The hearsay judgment did succeed in interrupting border uh, pushbacks across the central Mediterranean for several years. We should hold on to the small victories where we, where we can, even if they are uh, temporary. But precisely, um, when Italy and the EU decided to seal off the central Mediterranean again at all and any cost, they decided to re-implement uh, a policy of refoulement, but one that operated by proxy, by proxy via the Libyan Coast Guard, however, trained, um, equipped, signing political agreements with the Tripoli-based governments, deploying military vessels in Libyan territorial waters, supporting Libya as well in declaring its search and rescue zone so that violent interceptions, interceptions at gunpoint could, we, could be perpetrated with um, a humanitarian varnish and appearing as legitimate rescue. And in this way, Italy and the EU established a practice of refoulement 
by which migrants are intercepted by the Libyan Coast Guard. As you can see here, the, the, the passengers are on the deck of a Libyan patrol vessel donated by Italy, while European assets stay at a distance and um, inform, coordinate the, the Libyan Coast Guard, but never enter into physical contact with um, migrants. So you can see here the way border violence, once again, as long as the, the systemic and structural conditions that produce and reproduce violence are not uh, themselves transformed, border violence adapts to even uh, the moments when it is uh, different modalities are contested and maybe temporarily um, interrupted. But that does not mean that we should stop documenting or litigating. It means, it means that we must follow states in their changing practices and contest them anew. And that is what we attempted to do working with uh, Sea-Watch uh, and others, and of course a legal team involving Glenn and uh, Asji in particular. And with the Sea-Watch uh, vessel, we documented a particular incident of partly failed interception by the Libyan Coast Guard um, that was the basis for a complaint against Italy in front of the European Court of Human Rights that is still um, ongoing, SS and others versus um, Italy. The argument um, that was put forward by the legal team um, essentially sought to adapt the hearsay judgment by claiming that even though Italy did not enter into physical contact with the migrants because of this multi-layered cooperation and coordination um, deployed across the sea, um, in effect, it still exercised effective control over uh, the migrants and the Libyan Coast Guard were operating a practice that they could never have operated without this multi-form multi and level cooperation, coordination, and um, political agreements. Now, those who engage in litigation, even though they know that legal cases can take years for, to, for them to be processed by different courts, um, they do hope often that the sim simply the fact of filing a high-profile legal case may already act as a deterrent on state actors, give them the impression that they are being watched, that they will be held accountable, and that they can no longer continue uh, this practice with impunity. Unfortunately, as you see, the case was filed on the 8th of May 2018, and only weeks later, Matteo Salvini was instituted um, as Italian interior minister. Matteo Salvini, of course, whom you know, is um, a far-right politician. Now, Matteo Salvini did not um, create this architecture of refoulement by proxy. We should note it is uh, a Democrat, Marco Miniti, uh, who did. But Matteo Salvini certainly radicalized it in the months that followed his institution. The rate of interception by the Libyan Coast Guard went even higher. And over the years that followed, we saw um, an increasing number of actors um, mediate once again between EU policies and practices and migrants' lives and bodies. No longer only the, the Libyan Coast Guard, but also merchant ships who were called upon, called upon not only to rescue, but also to disembark migrants in Libya once again. Um, a practice which migrants at times refused. Here you see a group of migrants on board the Nivin who for 10 days resisted being disembarked in the port of Misrata until they were violently disembarked by uh, Libyan forces. Nonetheless, we, we worked with them to file a legal case uh, against this practice. But this distance um, also increased vertically, if you will, through the deployment of aerial assets that particularly increased as well um, as of 2018. 
Unaframend, uh, here you see a, a slide from the Unaframend operation, very clearly describes in its own internal strategic reports the way it has withdrew its naval assets away from the Libyan coast and rather um, pushed forward to, def to a front line of defense, its aerial assets. And when you think about it, an aircraft is the perfect solution. It can monitor migrants, detect them, inform the Libyan Coast Guard, but an aircraft can't be called upon to rescue. And this is a very strong shift that we've seen towards aerial surveillance over the last years through military aircrafts, but most importantly, through um, Frontex drones. You can see here that um, Frontex drones have been deployed as of 2021. This is a, a photograph taken by um, Lorenzo Pezzani in uh, Malta uh, Airport. And this is um, the map that the border forensics team has produced involving Giovanna uh, Reder, Lorenzo Pezzani, and, and others of Frontex tracks over the central Mediterranean um, over 2000. Uh, 21. And what our investigation demonstrates is that Frontex drones and aircrafts more broadly play a fundamental role in the refoulement by proxy machinery, right? In fact, in 2021, Frontex aerial sightings contributed to more than one third of the 32,000 people who were pushed back to Libya to what we know are crimes against humanity, right? So with this series of investigations that I've summarized all too briefly, what I'm trying to suggest is that for much of our work over the last years, the question of distance, of indirect violence has been a fundamental problem that we've grappled with and sought to um, develop methods to register these forms of indirect violence spatially, processually between different actors and now even vertically to document these forms of violence, to make them visible but also intelligible and, of course, work as well with um, human rights lawyers to seek accountability for these practice and attempt to block them, even if temporarily. And this question of Border violence at a distance is one that is not restricted to the central Mediterranean. We can think of it um, in many other areas and think here of our investigation into um, the impact of border control in Niger, right? Here you have the two dimensions somehow captured into one. On the one hand, Niger was pressured by EU uh, states and institutions to crack down on migration, transiting through its country towards uh, Libya, right? So mediation in terms of actor. But that practice of increasing criminalization and control of migration led to the splintering roots um, uh, of migrants across the desert and to push them further away into more remote routes across the desert to areas in which should the, um, a truck, for example, uh, run out of fuel or encounter any other form of accident, the passengers would be pushed beyond the threshold of dehydration and death in their attempt to reach uh, the road, a small town, or um, a, a point where they could access water, right? So you see this question of, again, border violence at a distance through indirect modalities in so many different ways as absolutely crucial to many of our investigations over the last years. But I want to argue that in the trends that we're seeing of border violence across Europe and particularly at the external borders um, of Europe, we're also seeing a very different trend, which we might simply summarize as the collapse of distance. Just think here of Croatian border guards at the Croatia-Bosnia border, uh, Croatia border, 
brutally beating migrants on European soil and by European actors. You see the collapse of distance in all of the different senses that I've just been um, describing, right? Not only this, but at least some uh, states do not particularly hide these violent practices, right? These are pushbacks documented by Hungary itself, right? And as Andras Litterer of the Hungarian Helsinki uh, Committee describes in his tweet uh, of this map, you know, normally it's difficult to prove human rights violation of this magnitude. Then enters Hungary, proudly, pu proudly publishing hundreds of them on the police official website. So not only do we see um, these direct practices of border violence uh, spreading, being consolidating, systematized, and to a large extent normalized, we're also seeing this process despite um, litigation efforts. Hungary has been condemned for this practice by the European Court of Human Rights and by the European Court um, of, uh, of Justice. And this, to a certain extent, is um, putting into crisis some of the standard operational modes of human rights um, actors. So what is going on here? What is happening? And what can we do uh, about this? Um, here, I would like simply to sketch directions that we are thinking about, experimenting, as we begin to embark on a series of investigations that precisely no longer focus on developing methods to um, uh, register indirect and mediated forms of border violence, even though we continue to do that, uh, of, of course. But also as we try to develop new methods to document these forms of direct violence, but maybe in a slightly different way, acknowledging the limitations of simply revealing that which is already spectacularized by uh, authoritarian and illiberal uh, states. By the way, this is a, uh, a map that is absolutely fascinating for me, which uh, shows what Frontex describes as Operation Terra. What you can see is that, in fact, through different Frontex operations and member states' operations as well, the entire Eastern European borders, from Greece to Finland, is in fact constituted as a second sea. A second sea exactly in the space of, uh, in the sense of the Mediterranean, a space of dynamic border crossing and border reinforcing that is highly dynamic and transnational and that we need to understand as a totality rather than as discrete national uh, configuration or formations, even though, of course, the, the national dimension matters. So what's happening? And what can we do about it? And of course, I'll have to be uh, brief and sketch simply directions for uh, discussions as well. I think if we had to summarize in really few words why we are seeing this collapse of border violence, this kind of return to uh, defense um, that you were describing earlier on, Stefan, right? even after we have, have seen the complexification of border control and border violence over so many years. We could say, simply put, that um, these practices of direct border violence are a response to the power of migration, right? Summer 2015, the summer of migration as we refer to it, well, despite the different layers of border externalization, more than a million people arrived on European shores and trekked across Europe in search for safety, work, a place to rebuild um, their lives. And I think that, that at that moment, even though border externalization is in fact, since more than 20 years, the main line of consensus across the EU, you know, 
European member states, they can't agree on anything which, when, when it comes to migration, right? Since, you know, as, as soon as they need to think about how to redistribute migrants, this becomes a source of intense conflict. So until recently, the only line of consensus was keep migrants out of Europe at all and any cost through border externalization, right? But here a number of states, um, Spain, Hungary, Poland, Greece, and several others realized, you know what? No amount of border externalization will be enough. We need to try something different. And that something different is, I would say, severing the connection between access to territory and access to rights. People will continue to arrive on European territory, despite the layers of border externalization. And for those who do, we will either formally, in uh, formal policies or in informal practices that constitute de facto policies, we will deprive them of their access to rights. We will push them back summarily and prevent their, their access to protection and rights in any form. That would be my very schematic interpretation of the, the driver of this shift, which I would argue is a new dimension of increasing consensus across member states, which we're seeing as well with um, the asylum reform, which is also uh, consolidating some of these rights-denying practices. Now, what do we do uh, about this? Should we simply stop documenting border violence and litigating uh, uh, against it, considering, for example, that um, Hungary uh, doesn't particularly care? Well, I don't think that that is the conclusion that we should uh, draw, even though I do think we need to uh, stare very intently at the current circumstances and the limits of some of our uh, strategies. I think if we want to um, respond to uh, this um, trend in uh, border violence, we need, for example, to um, explore the following uh, directions. On the one hand, we do clearly need to question the limits of human rights strategies rather adapted to liberal democratic regimes in a context of increasing authoritarianism. We need to learn from anti-authoritarian practices of the past. We need to learn from the global south, human rights actors who have been operating under authoritarian conditions for years. What can we learn from them to contest human rights violations effectively in this particular context? We need, however, also to um, account for variations. Italy is not Hungary. Greece is different as well, right? In fact, Italy, when you consider this trend that I've just described towards a direct practice of border violence, has been to a certain extent well behaved. Italy still considers that uh, the rule of law and legal norms have some kind of value, and so it tries to evade those norms by shifting its practices. Greece doesn't formally acknowledge that it has a de facto pushback policy. It says, this never happened, right? And Hungary is yet on the other side of the spectrum. So the point here is that we need to understand these variegated strategies of evasion and denial and target our practices of documentation and litigation accordingly, right? The question we have asked ourselves over the years, a kind of conceptual and political compass, um, that we call um, the disobedient gaze is what are states seeking to reveal? And we try not to reveal that. And what are they seeking to conceal? And that is precisely where we try to intervene and make practices visible and intelligible. And that disobedient gaze, it needs to be adapted, uh, repositioned each time anew 
to try to address these evolving forms of border violence and these changing tactics, state tactics, of transgression, evasion, and uh, denial. Finally, we need to connect practices of all too direct border violence. Again, think of uh, the Bosnian, the Croatian uh, guards that we were seeing here, to the broader state EU policies, jurisprudence that are enabling those practices. In that sense, you could say that there is maybe um, a kind of paradox at, uh, at work. I would argue that to effectively document and contest practices of direct border violence, one needs to go beyond those very practices. One needs to reconstruct the, the different spatialities, temporalities, actors, processes that create the conditions for these practices to occur, right? Let me give you a, a concrete example from an investigation that we are uh, engaging with uh, at present concerning the massacre in Nador Melia in, on the 24th of June, 2022. He, that day, some 1,400 people tried to cross the border. They were trapped in uh, the border control uh, transit area. They were shot tear gas onto, they were beaten by both Spanish and Moroccan guards as Spanish actors sought to push back migrants uh, back to the Moroccan side. Well, here of course we are reconstructing as precisely as possible through these different, uh, the analysis of these different videos, but also satellite imagery, um, the precise unfolding of events on that day. But no less important is it for us to demonstrate um, the everyday racist border violence at that border over years. No less is it important to demonstrate the responsibility of Spain, but also of the European Court of Human Rights in legitimizing um, practices of pushback across the border, in particular with its NDNT judgment. Essentially, we try to link this spectacular incident of racist border violence to the everyday racism of that border, which subjects black people to uh, a differential and heightened exposure to uh, deaths. So what I'm trying to suggest again is that even if we're dealing with the most brutal direct practices of border violence, we cannot stop at those practices, we need precisely to reconstruct the broader conditions that make them possible. And in this approach, I'm inspired by uh, this passage from um, A.L. Weitzman and Matthew Fuller's uh, book called um, Forensic Aesthetics. Let me read a brief passage from this. Also, because I'm speaking amongst others to lawyers. In legal settings, it is only proximate, direct causes that count in coming to a determination of cause or of guilt. This can be called a requirement for minimal causation. The complex, multiple causes, which may be social, cultural, economic, environmental, and so on, that bear on a particular event, what we call field causality, are discounted in such settings or heard only as mitigating circumstances. Counter-investigations try to work both with minimal causation and field causality. To study the mechanics of an incident, an act of police shooting perhaps, and do so within the constraints of what I might, might add, a bounded space-time by establishing trajectories and culpabilities. But for counter-investigations, violence is always larger and more pervasive than the cordoned off area of the crime scene. Pervasive environmental, cultural, and economic forces bear on the incident, often crystallizing it. So 
It is thus the task of those practicing counter-investigation to follow the threads leading from the minimal cause of the incident outwards towards the world of which it is part. So I find this incredibly uh, important and inspiring. And you see, again, if I have to summarize the arc, I'm suggesting that part of our focus has shifted from indirect modalities of violence to direct violence, but that in that same process, the methods of reconstructing extensive processes, actors, and causes across temporalities and scale beyond the cordoned off crime scene remains just as important. In that sense, I want to suggest that despite the process of normalizing brutal violence that we are seeing at present, but despite the undermining of um, legal norms and migrants' uh, rights that we are seeing at present, practices of documentation of border violence, of litigation against border violence, are absolutely remain absolutely uh, essential today, even though they need to be repositioned, reconfigured to um, become agentic uh, once again. However, we do need to come back to my initial uh, comments on the structural dimension of border violence. Practices of documentation, litigations are important. They should be uh, engaged with. They're important, but also modestly so. They can have an impact, but they won't be in and of themselves sufficient to durably end um, border violence, which is generated structurally. Only the transformation of the systemic causes of border violence can bring border violence to an end. That means that the migrants' rights and migrant solidarity movement must forge alliances with other actors working against racism, working for global or environmental uh, justice as well, and together transform those conditions so that borders can seek, cease to be spaces of violence and, if they must still exist, become spaces of passage and transformation, as uh, Edouard Glissant um, calls for them. Let me stop at, uh, at that. I think I've been uh, far too long already, uh, Stefan. Um, and I look forward to continuing to think uh, with you about those possible counter strategies that might be uh, up to the task of contesting border violence in the present. Thank you so much. Um, this was fascinating. This was uh, truly a uh, tour de force of, uh, well, showing really the structural, the structural factors and the whole industry of uh, border violence that um, basically has been going on over the past uh, three decades or so. And I was fascinated by, um, well, basically by the, <laughs> a bit random start of the engagement, really, of, of your engagement as well, that it takes, a, that it takes a, a random incidence, reading a press statement, an open heart, and really a lot of courage to basically come up, well, that basically results in such a fascinating project. I was, yeah, I'm, I'm really fascinated by that. And, um, but I don't want to. I don't want to take the floor. But I do want to uh, basically give the chance to well all of you basically to engage with uh, what Charles uh, talked about over the past um, uh, hour or so. Uh, there's a microphone here, so if you want to intervene, just raise your hands, please. Um, yeah, I was wondering uh, what happened to the number of migrant drownings between, uh, well, uh, Libya and Italy um, since that Libyan search and rescue res uh, operation started. <laughs> 
Yeah, let's uh, let's collect a couple of questions. So. Uh, this is maybe not your field entirely, but what would be an alternate route for the migrants to take? Because I guess for a lot of them, they cross throughout all of Africa. They don't just come from Libya going directly to Italy and the rest of Europe. Um, but the other routes also don't seem so easy. So like also going throughout the Middle East, uh, quite an unstable region, Syria, for example. Um, is the other option just like letting go of the whole visa system and just like letting everyone just book a flight or how would that possibly work? Um, <clears throat> sorry, um, I was wondering whether or not the uh, stop in pushbacks between two, 2011 and 2016 was uh, for a lack of trying of the EU or simply for a lack of a Libyan Coast Guard or state for that matter? It's about the case that you are uh, investigating at, at this moment that is in the Spanish border with uh, with uh, Morocco, I, I am Spanish, I follow in the news uh, what happened there. Um, what was what uh, really a, a big, um, for months were in the news what happened and where we're really surprised in Spain uh, is the amount of death that, are, that arrived. We don't understand really what happened because it was so, such an amount of people that were there, they looked like only the, 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 the wall, no? the metal wall fall, but the amount of people that died was, isn't, was still incomprehensible. And I think uh, what a little bit in the media was that it was the conditions before of the migrant was so bad, they were so tired and sick, that was the big reason of the amount of death, that it was not the, 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 the fact but it was the condition, and this a little bit, but it's still quite a scandal, really big, like many they are, but it's the biggest for sure. And I don't know if this is your investigation of the conditions of the people before, and is right. Thanks a lot for, for all those questions. Well, let me start by, by the last one um, and simply by saying that I, I'd rather not respond in detail to this one now as the investigation is ongoing. Um, but I can already share that uh, we will be foregrounding other causes of death uh, implicating both Moroccan and Spanish uh, authorities um, then the conditions uh, of the migrants as they arrived um, or the falling of, of that fence. Um, coming, so apologies to have to avoid uh, responding to this question now, but we can also discuss it if you would like uh, more informally uh, later. Um, on, the, on the other question, so what has happened to uh, the deaths at sea and mortality? Um, with the implementation of the Libyan Coast Guard um, uh, as, a, as a, the, the outsourced uh, border guard for the EU. Um, I'd need to look precisely at that whole trajectory to answer your, your question in a, in a fact-based way. What I can say is that for the phases that we have analyzed, we regularly f saw an inverse relation, right? So the more... Whereas we had demonstrated in the past that the more rescue NGOs were deployed at sea, the lower the, the mortality rate, yeah? For the Libyan Coast Guard, it's the opposite. The more they had vessels, the more people died at sea. Now, that's for the periods that we analyzed specifically, uh, 2017, uh, for example, and one, one would need a more careful analysis um, overall. I think it's also important that we cannot um, assess um, policies and border policies specifically only as a result of death, right? So say, let's say for a minute, let's consider for a minute 
that less people are dying at sea thanks to the, the intervention of the Libyan Coast Guard. Let's consider that for a second, even though uh, we've shown that at different moments it was not the case. Dozens of thousands of people are being brought back to arbitrary detention, slavery, torture, right? And some of that violence will be lethal, but much of it is not. In fact, torture is often uh, targeting living people and they need people to just be alive, to be able to extract money from their families, right? So we cannot simply measure um, border policies only by their impact on the number of deaths. In fact, unfortunately, uh, border violence materializes in many, many different forms, which are often sublethal. Take simply the, the, the conditions that asylum seekers encounter across Europe, uh, the particular spatialities, temporalities of their stay that often result in uh, physical and mental health uh, harm. That's no less important for us. We, we need, however, to develop different methods to register and contest those um, forms of violence. Alternative uh, routes, one of you was uh, um, asking. Well, there I would, in fact, uh, take my, the opposite uh, argument and recall that during the summer of 2000, 15, when most migrants stopped using temporarily the central Mediterranean and shifted towards the Aegean, right, which is a much shorter route, and for that summer people were self-organizing their transport, actually it is the lowest mortality rate in recent Mediterranean history, right? That summer, it's not the NGOs, it's not us, it's the collective decision to cross through a shorter and safer route during a time when the crossings were largely um, self-organized, right? So, of course, those conditions change over time, right? But I'm, I'm pointing to that particular moment as I think it's, it, it demonstrates also the power of migration to, um, uh, to attempt to combat deaths um, as well. Now, Yes, today all of these different routes have become uh, highly surveyed and perilous for those who, who cross them. What should be done? Should there be no uh, visas you were uh, suggesting, right? Well, you see, I would say that visa restrictions should be lifted if we want to put an end to border violence. That seems absolutely essential. Now, I, I know I'm going to be told, oh, but Charles, this is not very realistic. Uh, this is not exactly on the policy, uh, EU policy uh, agenda, right? I actually think that that is the only realistic approach. It's realistic because it starts from the reality of the dynamics of migration, right? Policies, restrictive policies, are trying to deny that reality. Except that, you know, I think that if restrictive policies would simply end uh, so-called unwanted migration, well, after more than 30 years of those policies, we would know it, right? I think that's the only realistic approach, starting from the reality of migration and giving a legal framework for it to unfold, right? Look, it's the same as drugs, same as alcohol, whatever, right? If you implement policies that are completely at odds with social reality, all you will generate is conflict, evasion, suffering, right? Start from reality. Give a framework for it to unfold, right? Now, I do think, however, it's a complete illusion that you can respond in a definite way to the problem of migration through migration policies only. I think that's a complete illusion, right? Such a policy that I certainly call for, right? A policy that would acknowledge the right of people to move, that would give a legal framework for the reality of migration to unfold, 
must be accompanied by all sorts of other practices and policies. It has to be accompanied by a strong anti-racist movement and policy across uh, Europe and the global north. It has to be accompanied by broader re redistribution. Um, it has to be accompanied by an end to support to authoritarian regimes so that they implement, amongst others, uh, restrictive migration policies. Right? So, yes, I do call for an end to visa restrictions, but I, I also really believe that um, this needs to be articulated, embedded in a whole range of other practices and policies for, it, for this to truly have emancipatory uh, effects. I, I forgot one, but I'll pick it up after. Um, as we're slowly, I would just want to ask one uh, question. So um, you addressed a lot of, you addressed a lot of uh, vertical violence in your talk. So basically, violence inflicted by the state upon migrants, um, and you left out one issue. So where there's violence, there are also profits, mm -hmm. vice versa. The multi-annual financial framework of the EU uh, from 21 to 27 uh, accords 23 billion euros to the field of migration and border management. The technologies that are employed by the EU are not developed by EU member states themselves. They are developed by private companies. So in a sense, private companies dictate and shape the enabling conditions. So they create the enabling conditions for what border management can actually do. Um, so I was, I was curious about, um, is there any thought from your side on making visible also the, basically a bit the trail of the money. So where uh, do, who profits from this, within this border industry? Where are the actors who sell, who produce all of these products. This speaks a bit to both the enabling conditions and also to the field causality that you mentioned. Oh, thanks for that, um, that question. Well, look, I think it's, um, we, we have our small agency with limited capacities and we don't investigate all forms of border violence or all its ramifications. So, um, you know, the, the role of private actors, we've looked at it with merchant ships, for example, in different moments, and we looked at it with the, with the drones. So we are considering also avenues of accountability uh, concerning the drone operators, which are uh, companies working in collaboration with uh, Frontex. But for the broader migration industry, you know, I would refer back to the, the work of um, TNI on the migration industry, I would refer to the work of ASGI that has traced particular flow of Italian uh, funds. So there, we're lucky to be a broad movement and that there, there are you know, a range of actors who have been looking at this specifically. But yeah, I absolutely agree, it's, it's, uh, it's very important. I would just add a point on the question of a focus on top-down state-imposed uh, violence, which has been um, one of our focuses. And one might also mention the violence uh, between migrants groups or perpetrated by smugglers. Of course, I've mentioned this in relation to Libya, for example. But look, in uh, Hungary, you know, migrants are really stuck between the Hungarian states and its pushbacks, but also by smuggling networks uh, that have become essential to pass. I mean, you have people being scalped if they go to the wrong smuggler or try to cross uh, without having recourse to a smuggler, right? It's, it's, it has become extremely violent. But it has become extremely violent as a result of what I would refer to as, if you will, the over-determining role of restrictive state policies and practices. The more states make the crossing difficult and criminalize the crossing, the more migrants have to resort to professional groups to uh, 
uh, attempt to cross borders. Uh, and, and, the, and these can be, in certain instances, um, extremely um, violent uh, as well. Thank you so much, Charles. Well, um, we've definitely strained your generosity in terms of time, and I'm afraid we also uh, strained our uh, time budget being here. Um, so thank you again, and uh, please join me all in uh, thanking Charles for this fascinating talk. <laughs>